So in this video, I want to talk to you about how do researchers actually avoid bias. So if you don't know me, I am Professor Dave Maslach. I'm Associate Professor of Innovation Strategy in Entrepreneurship. And I created this whole reciprocity project to give back as much as I possibly can. There's so many people to help me out that I want to pay the favor for to help you out as much as I possibly can. So if you want to help out with the project, you can see I'm creating this sort of sharing economy editing platform. Go on there and, and, and buy some credits. It's going to really, really, really help out with this project. So, um, you know, this is a really important topic, I think, in terms of avoiding biases within research. And I'm going to be upfront with this is no researchers can ever avoid biases. We all have inherent biases with the decisions that we make. That's just what we do as human beings is we don't, we can't process all available information. And even if you had the biggest computer, you had an unbiased computer, you would still run into this exact same problem. Computers have a limited amount of information that they can process. Everything in this world is, is biased. Everything that we do is biased towards something that we can accomplish quicker and more efficiently. And this is just kind of a fundamental truth to any decision making that literally everybody makes in this world. So we all have biases. And, um, you know, it's not that we actually avoid them. It is actually mitigating the risk of those particular biases and thinking about, you know, not only that there is risk of, of a bias of something bad happening from from the bias, but also that, um, you know, to what extent that sort of badness actually happens. There's, there's a lot of biases that don't really matter um, in, in the grand scheme of things, but every once in a while there is a bias, you know, maybe you have some sort of biased belief on something that really does sway or has a large impact on, on the scientific effort. And so you have to be careful about those particular things. So I think the first thing um, in terms of mitigating these biases as researchers, it's just being as fair as you can and trying to be an, uh, you know, a, a, a bystander of, of the research and look back and, and avoid those biases. And you can't do it. You literally cannot do this. But that's the best possible thing you could do is have in the back of your mind of thinking about, I'm going to try to fairly assess this. Um, it's very hard to do, and, and there's there's lots of reasons for this. It's not only just because of decision making, but there is pressure to publish in the research community and pe pressure to get you know research grants and things like that. Um, and so there is a real pressure to do things as quickly as you possibly can. And so you have to push back on that so that you can do an, a fair assessment of what you're actually looking at. Another thing that I think a lot of people assume sort of mitigate biases is the peer review process where you send a, an article to a, a journal and somebody assesses it and it's double blind review. You still can't, you, you definitely can't mitigate those biases even when that happens. People can still get through the review process by, you know, knowing how to write, knowing how to publish and those kind of things. And their work might be biased or they might not have spent as much time as another person on, on, on an article or doing data analysis. So that's an important thing to think about. A third thing that I think is, is important in mitigating these biases is to write down as much detailed information as possible such as somebody could replicate your work. It doesn't mean that people are gonna replicate it, although that there is an effort right now in terms of people replicating work a little bit more. And so having that detailed information to show that you can replicate these kind of things, um, that is an important thing, those insights. So it's tricky though, because when you're publishing research, it's often hard to disclose all stuff. And it's in fact, it's impossible to disclose everything um, it, it just makes a really boring story if you disclose everything you, you did because it's unlimited amount of information that you're processing in your entire thought process. And so we have to be picky and choosy with the stuff that we actually write down and we detail. And we just have to be very careful in what we're actually detailing with that um, in terms of that somebody could, you know, at least in theory, go through and, and write about some of the stuff. Another important source of mitigating biases is disclosing financial sources. We're all paid somehow, otherwise we wouldn't be able to eat. 
And so telling people what these financial um, sources are, so it's, it's weird. We don't disclose that our university or our institution actually um, pays us, but we disclose if there's something else. Maybe sometimes, you know, a pharmaceutical company, that's kind of the, you know, that the, the sort of standard um, way to think about this pharmaceutical company gave money to a research to, researcher to investigate a drug that they are doing work on. Doesn't mean it's biased, um, it just means that there, there possibly could be a bias towards that, but um, they would get into a lot of trouble if they did actually bias the research. So that's the, th the fifth thing I think is most scientists just think about the penalty of, um, you know, if they bias too much and if they, they were viewed as completely unbiased, there's a massive penalty to do that because people are going to discount all of your work. Um, and they're also going to discount everything that you're going to do going forward. So there is this massive, massive penalty of, of a bias that's there. And, and often you might be blacklisted if, you, if it was really severe. And people might not ever pay attention to what you're doing. You might not get a job. You might lose your job. So the penalty is, is massive. Um, and that's kind of the downside, I think, with having bias or thinking about this is you know, it's a subjective call in terms of what people believe is, is your biases and stuff like that. So I'm very cognizant of that. In, in a lot of researchers, a lot of scientists are very cognizant of that, that they're, you know, thinking about what other people are thinking of you and what kind of work you're doing and the quality of work that you're doing. I think that's a massive, um, that is really, really important. And as somebody that's like, you know, I, I do have a lot of self-doubt and I, you know, I have lots of stuff going on up there in terms of, you know, am I good enough and all that kind of stuff. I think it's a really important, um, it's a deterrent, I think, in, in, in science. It's a really strong deterrent that I think we need to address somehow um, of thinking about how do we encourage people to do wild and crazy things that are unique and interesting, that are novel, but at the same time doing it well. And I don't know what the great, you know, I don't know what a good solution is to that. I think the solution is to be open and transparent and, and tell people what you're doing. You know, for example, this reciprocity project, I do want to actually be able to do research and stuff like that on it eventually or open it up to researchers. If, you, if you're a researcher and you're thinking of doing like, um, you know, randomized controlled trials on an online platform, give me a shout. I would love to hear that kind of stuff. Um, in terms of ideas, and in, in, in you could you could definitely use it, but you know we have to think about the penalty of um, you know of doing these kind of things. These novel things are are sometimes viewed as is they are risky, and so science tends to be very conservative that way um, because of the penalty of doing something that is so unique and different, and and it is not healthy i don't think for science i think we can stretch a lot more by encouraging more novel and interesting things where people are willing to do something that is not going to be the status quo um, and so the more that we reach out and i think it's changing i definitely think i could see in the last um you know at least within the last couple of decades it is becoming very the sort of novelty of people doing stuff is becoming interesting um, and, and people that can do all sorts of random and uh, interesting things. I think it's more of a symptom of our, of our culture and society in general in terms of embracing these things. So with that, hopefully this answers your question in terms of how do you actually avoid biases in scientific research. And really we can't, but we can mitigate um, as much as we can. And in a lot of it's through transparency, a lot of it's like through personal building personal character. I think that's a really important thing. Um, and then, you know, just really thinking about what's the penalty if somebody actually finds out that something is going on. Um, it, it, that's a really big thing. And, and there's just a lot going on with that. So with that, give me a thumbs up if you like this video. Do subscribe to the YouTube channel. Take care and have a wonderful day. Bye.